We've got two sessions that we're going to do this morning. Uh, the first session is continuous load path framing, and we'll get into some of the concepts and some of the things that we, as builders and remodelers, need to know about continuous load path and why it's so important. So I'll start right at the bottom here. What we're doing here with a standard anchor bolt is we're going to take our bottom two plates, we've got them connected together. The next thing we need to do is make sure that we've got connection from one to the next. Now there's a number of ways to do that. If our continuous load path does not keep coming all the way through, we have a break in that continuous load path, we're going to get a break there. So there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, one of the things that is familiar is this is an STA D10. I'll show you one of the ones before they've been set. What you'll do with the, the SDA, these are very common on your corners. Now this gets set in place during the pouring of the foundation. There's a clip that goes on here that you can actually set this in place, get it on the side of your foundation and nail it. I personally will not let the foundation contractor do this. I need to be there for that. He doesn't understand necessarily thickness of sheathing. He may put it too far out the side of the building. I want to center this on my corner post in here because this is going to give me continuous load path from the foundation all the way up right across our rim and right up our framing structure here. You're going to have a number of these straps perhaps specified. You don't need to have one on every single stud. That would be a little bit of an overkill, probably too much. There's other ways to do it too. There's, instead of anchor bolts, this is kind of a new, this is pretty slick. This is called an uh, MASA. This is a mud sill anchor. This gets set in while you're pouring. So you're going to put this right down uh, on the foundation. Here's your anchor point. And there's a number of things you can do with that. In my case here, let me move my two by eight. You can see how that mud sill anchor has been brought up and nailed to the bottom plate. But that only connects my bottom plate. This can also wrap down around the plate, a single plate, if you're doing, uh, let's say a slab, you can wrap that over the top of that or you can run it up one stud. So there's a number of applications. But here's how you're gonna, you can get that mud sill anchor plate down. And that's sure a lot easier than finding out where all those bolts are going to go. So this is one way to get around that problem. If you're still using anchor bolts, here's a little trick for this. This is one of the things that I do, is I'll take and make a template. Just use some scrap wood, and I'll lay out my window while I'm you know, going over my plans. In a case like this, say this is a two by, this is an eight inch concrete wall that we're going to pour for a foundation. I'll make templates up. I can make them up out of two bys. You can make them up out of three quarter inch plywood if you want, but I find the tendency for that is that they often won't bring the bolts up high enough unless I'm there, because if I need to get through another inch and a half. But what I've done here is I've got a window layout. A number of windows fit this layout, say window number 15, 18, 19, 21. This is on the job site. And I'll take center lines from the outside of the foundation, say starting on the left hand side figure out the center lines of all my window and door openings. That allows me to drop this while they're, after they're finished their pour and they're getting ready to set their anchor bolts. I'll drop this in and center it exactly where that window needs to go because I may be using a hold down such as an HTT4. This is one of the, and you've seen these, these are specified on a lot of our jobs. That needs to go right alongside. It's gonna go right here. That's an HTT4 right there. And we're gonna nail that and with an HTT4 on the bottom, I can make a connection. But in this case, I need to get my HTT4, say, on my slab. So what I'll do is I'll have that position so I know when I frame, that bolt is going to be in the perfect location. Absolutely perfect, because I've already set my windows up ahead of time. You don't want to say, well, you know, a lot of guys say, well, you know, Mike, I don't like that kind of tolerance, because, you know, suppose, like, it's off just you know, a little bit, so I'm going to move it over an inch or so. If you move that over an inch and then you frame, you've got a one inch gap in here, that's not going to give you the structural stability you need. It needs to be right up against that two by. One thing you can do, if you are off a half inch or an inch or so, you'll need to fully pack that. You're going to have to pad that with a three quarter inch ply or a one. It's got to be nice and tight so that when you put your approved fasteners in, and approved fasteners are not always one and a half inch nails. 
right? It seems that's the universal thing for the framer. They like the one and a half inch nails, but guess what the building inspector is going to look at? When he comes, if this calls for a two and a half inch nail and you have a, a smaller nail in here, the first thing he's going to look at is the code that's right on top of that nail. When he sees this little number eight, he says, you got to pull all those nails out and put two and a half in. Can't use an eight. So make sure that you pay attention to the specification on that. So let's follow this load path up as we go. So what we have here, in this case, we've got our mud sill anchored down. I've got those. I need to have some connection between here and my stud so I can pull this whole floor system together. So I've got a continuous load path coming up here. What you'll often see is strapping. Guys put strapping underneath the mud sill plate and they bring that up and then they nail that. That's a very common detail you'll see out here on the East Coast. But probably one of the most common because it's boilerplate. And what I mean by boilerplate is the architect puts right on the beginning, he says, on the sheet that that cover sheet there, this is how you'll do all your connectors. A lot of them just copy the same thing over and over and over again. It's not always the best design for what you're building for. I Personally, what I like to do is I'll get in touch with my local Simpson rep and I'll let him look at the boilerplate and he'll probably tell me, Mike, you, you don't need to do that. Let me give you some other suggestions. So we're going to show you some alternative ways to do this continuous load path, but you've got to make sure that everything is connected. So here's the this is the HTT4. What you would do with two of these, I've got one on the top and I've got one on the bottom. And a threaded rod would go completely through. So you can see the connection that I've got. I've got my, perhaps my strap that's coming underneath the mud sill plate. We've got a connection all the way down to our foundation. We've got this HTT4, which is going to pull together our first and second floor. So that's one way to span the distance between the first and second floors here, is using an HTT4. A more common one that you'll see too is the straps. Here's a 49 inch strap. Framers will throw these on and then just nail the daylights out of this. But here's a point that you might not be aware of. When you're framing, your lumber is probably 20% moisture content or better. You ever get that wet lumber? If it's wet and there's water coming out of it, that's fiber saturation. When that dries, when that lumber begins to dry down and you start to roof load on here, you start putting roof shingles on, this joint in here is going to get smaller. If you nail this completely off before you load your roof and before this really dries down a lot, what's going to happen is it's going to buckle right here in the middle. And you don't have really a continuous, you've got a partial continuous load path with a little bit of buckle in there. You could get uplift that's going to straighten that out. So what you'll want to make sure you do is we'll just leave, we'll nail off one side and we'll let the other one float for a while. I'm not going to come back and nail this off completely until I've got the roof load on it. Once I've roof loaded it, this is all set down. I can continue to nail off on the bottom. Now, I'm not going to nail any all of these on because uh, you can imagine what it'll be like to take it apart at the end of the, our session here. It's not too good. So here's another way to make that connection. A lot of the contractors don't like all of the strapping on the outside, so that's why these HTT4s are good. They're usually specified around window openings because when you have a very large window opening, you lose all of the hold down capability across the opening of the window. So you'll find HTT4s on both sides of your large window and door openings. Getting that bolt in the right spot is really critical. This is what's called uh, an LFTA. Here's another alternative way where you can make a connection across. You want to bridge this connection, continuous load path, so that we've got a strap that you'll nail on the inside and the inside of the stud. This is a very strong connection, uh, very well used in high wind areas. You're going to use these LFTAs. They actually make some really thick ones, almost a, probably a 3 16th steel or so that's, that can be bolted through as opposed to nailed on. And that's for even higher wind loads or different structural uh, capabilities of those particular items. This is something that you should keep in your toolbox. This is a CTS-218. you have any idea what you do with this? I didn't know what it was for because we used to cheat when we did these. What does your plumber do when he runs a three-inch pipe through your plate here? Right? As soon as your plumber cuts through this top plate, you got this big gaping hole here. How do you keep this plate from spreading? Right, you got both of your plates cut. That's what this is for. This is the CTS 218. 
You're going to set one of these in place, and that will bridge this gap, and it will keep that from moving back and forth. Now, if you use strapping, a lot of guys use strapping. What's the problem with using a strap? It's good under tension, but when you put compression on it, it's not doing anything. So what you want to do is use the appropriate connector. Uh, this is the Simpson CTS-218. Nail this in, and it has the ability to resist compression and the tension. So we're looking at the building. We're working our way all the way up to the top. So we've got our connections. We've got a number of connections you can do. For retrofits, if you don't, just like the job I had to do, you can actually, this is a foundation to joist connection. So if you're working on, say, a crawl space, or you've got a, uh, an older building and you're putting a second story on top of it, you can't get to the original structure like this. It's almost impossible. What you can do now is use foundation to joist. This is going to bolt up against your foundation, and you'll be able to catch your joist with a couple of bolts in here. So that's how you get that connection. This is just a, this is a taller one. This is called the FSA. So you'll be able to use the right bolts for that or you can use the nails. So alternate ways to make the same type of connection. But it's really important that you make sure that it's continuous. You'd want to get a, a weak link, link in here. Let's take a look up further, work our way up the wall. Right, let me grab a hammer and a couple of nails here, just so I can set a couple of pieces. We get up to the window opening. We've got our HTT4, we've got our straps, we've got this all connected. We need to continue that all the way up to the top. The most common connector that you will find in this whole array, recognize one of these? This is a hurricane clip, very popular. These were probably the earliest ones that we started using in hurricane clips. And we didn't use continuous load path because the initial thought was, well, let's keep the roof from blowing off. Once the roof blows off, we have a lot of problems. So we would use these hurricane clips, and they were left and right ones. And you'd put them up here on the top plate and you're connecting the right you're just connecting your roof rafter and you're connecting that to your top plate but without continuous load path what's the real problem here it can separate from the stud and so we have to do a little bit more than this another thing too even though we have continuous load path maybe you'll take one of your straps common detail that I've seen out in the field as you come across a window I've seen this done a number of ways. Guys will take a strap and they'll run it up this way and come right over the top and wrap it around so that you can make the connection between your header and your top plate. And so you've got that continuous load path going on there. And then you put on one of these little hurricane clips. And where is it easier to put these on? On a two-story house. It's easier to put them on from the inside, isn't it? Right? So most guys go on the inside and then they connect the top plate to this, but what can happen with that? If, especially if you're just using your plywood to hold this together, you get uplift and it can rotate the entire roof. When that rotates, all this does is bend. It's not gonna prevent uplift. So you've gotta make sure that the connector that you've got is going to work on both sides here. So you may need to put the two, two fives on both sides, one on the inside and one on the out. You also have what's called an H1. This is another alternative way to do that. And one that I didn't get, that I'm sorry I didn't get in my little package here, I just discovered. What do you call that new one where it uses a single screw right up through the plate? You know what that, what is that one? An STWC. This one is really slick because you put that from the inside. It's a plate that goes around your rafter or your truss from the inside. It's got a nice long screw. And there's an angle that you'll need to shoot for when you're screwing that in, depending on the pitch of the roof. One screw, you got the whole thing, is just really going to come together nice. So it's a nice way to do that. Here's another one that you may use over a header. This is called an H10S. So we can put an H10. I'm just going to put one nail in here to hold it. So that makes a good connection between your header all the way up to your roof rafter or your truss. They make an H10S-2 for double. So we've got to make sure that we've got and followed this continuous load path all the way from top to bottom. And again, make sure that your prints are done in a way that you're, you don't want to spend too much money on your connectors. But sometimes it, it pays 
to buy a more expensive connector that will do a larger section of the wall because the engineer is going to look at this whole wall as a unit and he'll do the engineering for you or even the Simpson rep can help you with some of that so maybe rather than have 100 straps in here some heavier hardware will eliminate a lot of that work so there's a lot of options for you but just keep in mind that wherever that weakest link is that's where your building is going to fail and to that make sure that when you're buying your connectors that you're getting the right ones you want to make sure that don't go into the catalog and say oh this this looks like the one that's in the picture that's on my print on the print it should give you a number look at that number and in this case this is an H7Z if it calls for a Simpson H7Z this is the one that will go up this actually comes in never remember how to do these yeah comes in and you can wrap it over the top I got it upside down probably you're going to wrap it right over the top of the, of the rafter here. That's it. You're going to pull that over the top. And that's going to give you extra hold down. But keep in mind that if you don't do your planning ahead of time, if your framer is not on the job when you start, and you don't stack frame like this, you're going to, it's going to cost you a lot more money to do your continuous load path. Because if we're offset here, I'd have to do two sets of connectors to be able to connect this stud to one that's over here. So make sure that your framer is really on point with this. So when you start your continuous load path, you've got it all the way from top to bottom.